G'day everyone. Welcome to the second video in week two of our course in Legal Ethics and Trust Accounting. Now, in ethics, it can be dangerous and a bit silly to describe one document or one principle as being more important than another. Every bit of ethics is important at the same time. Having said that, though, in this video, we're going to look at the ethical rules that you're most likely to deal with on a daily basis in your life as a working solicitor. These are the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, or the ACSR. Most of this course is based on the ACSR. The regulation of legal practitioners goes back centuries and centuries. The first formal rule that we know of was actually passed in the Statute of Westminster of 1275. That's roughly in the era of Robin Hood. In those days and throughout medieval times, there were solicitors and barristers and sergeants who were the third branch of the profession. The 1275 statute prohibited deceit or collusion by any sergeant, counter or other in the king's court. This looks a lot like some of the modern rules that say that practitioners are not allowed to mislead the court and they're required to give their best efforts for the client which would mean no collusion. Over the centuries, the rules binding legal practitioners have evolved as the profession has evolved. The most recent significant evolution was the implementation of the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules. You have to bear in mind that each state has its own independent courts and each state has its own legislation establishing and regulating the legal profession. The Legal Profession Act, which we met in the first video, is a Queensland Act. And so, until quite recently, each state and territory had its own specific rules for solicitors. Now, realistically, this wasn't a massive problem. It's not like the rules were completely and utterly different between jurisdictions. For instance, it's not like Western Australia let non-lawyers appear in the Supreme Court or New South Wales allowed solicitors to lie in affidavits or anything like that. But there were different documents in each jurisdiction. And this didn't make a lot of sense, especially in a world where lawyers are more and more mobile and lawyers might well have matters in more than one jurisdiction. And so, under the leadership of the Law Council of Australia, the various state and territory law societies worked collaboratively to produce a harmonised common set of rules which were then adopted by each jurisdiction. These rules are the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules. So, as practitioners in Queensland, we're still regulated by Queensland law, but the Queensland law says that we follow the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules. Those rules are divided into chapters, and those chapters, you'll be surprised to learn, correspond very closely with the topics for this course. The first substantive chapter is called Fundamental Duties of Solicitors. It talks about the fact that a solicitor's primary duty is to the Crown and to the Court. This is essentially the material that we cover in Week 4. Then there's a chapter called Relations with Clients, which talks about the need to provide clients with advice, the need to follow their instructions, the need to put the client's interests ahead of your own, the duty of confidentiality, the duty to avoid conflicts of interest. These are all topics that we'll discuss in this course in weeks 5, 6 and 7. Third, there's a chapter called Advocacy and Litigation which sets out specific rules binding solicitors when they're appearing in court or undertaking work directly associated with court. That's the material we look at in week 11. The fourth and fifth substantive chapters are about the relationship of a solicitor with other solicitors and the relationship of a solicitor with third parties, people who are neither clients nor colleagues nor the court. We look at this material in week 10 of our course. Finally, there's a bunch of rules which bind the way that law practices can operate. They talk about rules for advertising. They talk about whether law practices can share premises or revenue with other types of professional practice. They talk about the rules that a judge has to follow if they retire from the bench and return to practice as a lawyer. These rules, they're all very interesting, but they're unlikely to really trouble you as a new graduate solicitor, so they're not really a focus for this course with the exception of one, 
which we're going to deal with right now, right up front at the start of our course, and that's rule number 42, anti-discrimination and harassment. Let's start with anti-discrimination. Australia and each Australian state have quite comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation. You can't lawfully discriminate against anyone on the basis of sex, relationship status, pregnancy, parental status, race, age, impairment, religion, political beliefs, lawful sexual activity, gender identity, sexuality or family responsibilities. Discrimination against someone on the basis of those factors is unlawful and that includes in legal practice. This means different things in different contexts. It means that a law firm can't choose only to hire men or women, nor can it give people of one type an advantage over others based on a protected status. It means that a firm can't choose not to brief a barrister simply because the barrister is, say, Indigenous or Christian or gay. It means you can't select clients on the basis of these attributes either. This is not just a matter of decency, and it's not just a matter of law. It's a matter of the fundamental question of how we see the law. Ideally, we all stand before the law as equals. Now, truth be told, as a profession, we have often fallen short of the mark here. And it's still notorious, for instance, that Indigenous Australians have an entirely different experience before the courts than non-Indigenous Australians. The experience of women who've suffered sexual offences is also often studied as an area where the justice system falls short. But our principle, our ethic, that we as individuals can practice on a daily basis is to do everything we can to practice without discrimination. And you have to do it deliberately. Discriminatory behaviour can sneak up on you. You can do it without intending to or without ever meaning to offend. You might see a new female colleague wearing a wedding ring and ask what her husband does, only to learn that she has a wife. You might make arrangements to meet a client in a place that turns out to be inaccessible to their disability. You might assume that other practitioners will be able to respond to you at 5.30pm without realising that some will have parenting responsibilities. Sexual harassment is even more complicated. Unlike some professions, the law has no general rule against engaging in sexual relations with a client or with a former client. Sexual relations with a current client will almost certainly result in a conflict of interest, and we'll learn more about that in week six. But it's the conflict of interest that's the problem, not the sex or the relationship. The difficulty is, of course, that in most cases, clients come to us when they are in some way vulnerable. Family law clients, clients facing criminal charges, clients facing potentially prohibitive financial losses, clients who've already suffered losses and who are looking to us to help them to recover those losses. In those circumstances, it would be very easy for a client's sense of dependence and reliance to be mistaken for romantic affection. It's also quite likely that there might be a genuine spark between a client and their solicitor, but you still have to wonder whether that spark would be there if they met on equal terms. The only safe way is not to go there. Sexual harassment, of course, goes one step further and involves behaviour which has a sexual connotation, but which is more fundamentally inappropriate. In a case called the Council of the Law Society against Flynn, a solicitor had a family law client who terminated the retainer the decision doesn't say why, and she went to another solicitor. After she left, Mr Flynn pursued her. He invited her to dinner and suggested that she wear something sexy. She didn't respond, and in the course of an evening he sent 20 messages and a further 12 missed calls. It's not hard to see that this constitutes sexual harassment, and sexual harassment can be both professional misconduct and unsatisfactory professional conduct. Finally, workplace bullying. This is behaviour that could be expected to intimidate, offend, degrade or humiliate. Gosh, this is a difficult one in the context of adversarial law because you have an opponent and you're trying to beat that opponent. 
and judges in their courtrooms have virtually absolute power. A judge on a bad day can be a bully. Practitioners dealing with one another can be bullies. But when another practitioner writes to me and says that my submissions are misguided and that my client needs to withdraw their claim because it's doomed to fail, and if we have a conversation and our voices are raised, is this bullying or is it just advocacy? The line is much more difficult to find than you might expect. To me, the requirement not to engage in workplace bullying dovetails with our ethical responsibility to treat other practitioners with courtesy. I can tell another solicitor, your submissions are wrong and doomed to fail, but I can do that in a way that remains professional, that doesn't slip over the edge into belittling or personal attacks. It really comes back to some of those questions suggested by the Ethics Centre last week. Would you be happy for your conduct to be on the news tomorrow? If not, it's probably bullying and not just advocacy. Would you be happy if everyone acted as you were acting? If not, it's probably bullying and not just advocacy. But on all these things, the line can be hard to identify. For our purposes now though, in this video, it's important that you understand the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules are a thing, that they are the central document governing the solicitor's half of the profession, and that we're about to spend weeks talking about them. There are still other important documents though, and in the next video, we're going to move on and talk about the rules of court and the bar rules. See you in video three.